Uh, what are you truly passionate about? Oh, yeah. So, uh, obviously, we're really passionate about um, conservation, but I don't really consider myself a conservationist. Right. Um, I think we're sort of interested in basically, well, I'm personally interested in solving complex problems. Um, and I think the poaching crisis is, is a very complex problem. I mean, you have lots of, of things going on. You have government, you have, uh, you know, uh, Syndi you know, black market syndicates, you have, um, you know, technology, you have uh, economics, you have different languages, different cultures. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a complex problem. And I guess that's, you know, very attractive to me because it's, it's, there's lots of things you need to learn, lots of things you need to understand. Um, and then you have to figure out the best way that you can probably make an impact on that, on that problem. And that's kind of, what I'm passionate about, I guess. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, why why create? Um, is it pronounced pembient? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why create pembient? Well, okay. So you've, the poaching crisis for rhinos started about uh, around 2006. So right. I guess that's already nine years ago now. Um, you know, it's it's slowly uh, it's crept over time. Uh, crept up over time. And if you look at now, like the compound annual growth rate of poaching in the last five years is like 30 percent yeah and i saw um, some recent articles from south africa stating statistics on how many rhinos have been pushed just this year alone yeah yeah, yeah. And, and so yeah last year it was a record year 1215 um and then this year it's unfortunate because now the government isn't releasing figures just as at a regular interval like they used to do but there's estimates you know that maybe 580 to 3 i don't know 390 have been killed or 360 and again it's, it's on track to be another record year again this right year. right um yeah so so i think we said like okay you know a lot of standard kind of conservation techniques have been tried um you know and basically if you don't measure the results of those techniques obviously you probably come to the conclusion that they're failing Right? I mean, so, you know, you can measure the number of rhinos killed, you can measure the growth rate in poaching, you can measure a lot of different things. Like, none of these trends, none of these statistics are positive in any way, and that's after, you know, nine years of effort. Right. So, basically, um, I think we, you know, we said, well, are there, are there other opportunities or other, you know, ways or, or, or processes that can that can be, uh, you know, used here in order to basically um, counter, counter the poaching, and, and I think... There are, you know, I think basically, if you look at, um, you know, in the West, like in, like with fur products, right? Like there's three things that go on with fur products, right? There's there's effective laws and regulations governing fur products. Right. There's um, there's basically organizations like PETA looking to reduce uh, the, the demand or consumption of real fur. Right. And then there's also substitute fur products for people who still like the feel or look of fur. Right. And still in that. without necessarily harming animals. Right. And so and you see that kind of repeat over and over again. And, and I guess we were kind of shocked that like that's not really sort of like ever used that substitute um, part portion of the of the of the of the, of the, of the equation is not really used when it comes to these problems uh, in, in you know in Asia. And that we thought that's kind of like a you know uh, a shame in some respects that like there should be a strong sort of like substitute uh, safety valve, I guess, so that people can't continue maybe their traditions right. they want to continue without necessarily causing ecological damage or anything else like that. Right. So yeah. Uh, that's where Pepe comes in. I said, we, we say we're founded on, on the belief that animals are precious and traditions are important. Yeah. Okay. So basically, traditions are important and animals are precious. Okay. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, so, so you know, it's hard to, to tell people to stop their traditions, yeah, right? Um, right? And you can tell somebody to stop maybe one tradition or a culture to stop one tradition, but, like, if you look at Asia, there's, like, so many traditions that, like, people want uh, stopped. They want the use of rhinoceros horn stopped. They want the use of uh, ivory stop. They want the use of shark fin stop. Right. They want the use of bear stop. They want the use of uh, manta ray stop. They want the use of tiger bone stop. They want, you know, I mean, it goes right, on and right, on. Right. So at some point, you can't, I don't think you can really just say you need to stop all these cultural traditions and practices and really expect that to happen. It's a hard, you know, it's a hard problem. Okay. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean. So, what are have been uh, Pembian's uh, milestones um, over the last six or twelve months? I mean, how long have you guys been in operation? Yeah, well, 
we started sort of as a project right. at a company initially, just trying to get gather data and, and learn more about the problem. And we started maybe about a year ago now, um, in, in maybe March of last year, I guess. Um, and then uh, we didn't incorporate it until January of 2015. So okay. there was definitely a period of months where we were just kind of running it as a project. And during those the milestones for that project, there were many. I mean, we basically we set out to first survey uh, the population there um, and try to learn more about how random harm is used and and their potential acceptance of alternatives. Um, and then based on some of that data, uh, we, we developed some prototypes um, in the lab um, that had the same physical and, and uh, analytical chemistry properties of, of rhino horn. We took some of those prototypes to uh, to Vietnam, and then in Vietnam, uh, you know, I, I was able to interview uh, some people who use rhino horn and get their feedback on not just the prototype, but also understand more about their life and, and what they're doing and why they're doing their their behaviors and stuff. And so, um, I would think those are all major milestones uh, leading up to uh, to basically our, our acceptance uh, at. Uh, into Indie Bio, which is uh, this biotech accelerator in San Francisco, where I'm speaking to you from right now. Oh, okay. Uh, um, yeah. So basically, uh, so it's kind of it's basically trying to prove out some of the science, and prove out some of the market, um, so that we would basically have a strong case uh, for acceptance into uh, into a biotech accelerator. Um, and then, you know, with the accelerator, uh, we get access to. Uh, um, uh, another set of lab capabilities, and we also got some money uh, to further our, our, our development. Okay, that's cool. What um, what do you foresee as the positive implications of um, the biotechnology on, on poaching? I mean, it's an obvious question, but I'd like to hear it directly from you. Sure, yeah. I mean, we're sort of, uh, you know, we're sort of part of a larger movement. Um, so, you know, in this accelerator even, and in Silicon Valley uh, specifically, there's several companies working on basically uh, removing animals uh, or removing or eliminating society's dependence on animals for animal products. Okay. Um, and so there's a company that's basically like ferment, fermenting um, like um, egg proteins, right. egg white proteins in yeast. So basically you can create you can chickenless egg. There's another company that's basically fermenting milk proteins in yeast, so you can create a, a milk without a cow. And so basically, we view uh, our, ourselves as an extension of that sort of movement, where we basically want to remove animals from the food and goods chain. Okay. Um, and, and poaching, we think, or with wildlife, we think there's a, a great opportunity to sort of jump over, because the next logical step for wildlife, unfortunately, is farming, right? I mean, there's already proposals to farm, um, you know, rhinos and whatnot. Right. So, so just, we're hoping that the technology could could do what it's doing right now, where basically companies in the United States are trying to remove animals from the factory farms. Right. So basically, you don't you don't need animals in the factory farms. We're hoping we can just jump over that phase where you have to farm wildlife products and just jump right to the end phase, which we believe is is to get these uh, animal products. Okay, that's interesting that you you mentioned um, the possibility that the next step would be farming um, wildlife animals because I've I've. I've read a few and I've seen a few um, um, videos on um, lion canning where you know they actually raise lions purely for hunting purposes, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I could see what you mean by that. Um, have you guys considered possibly like what the reverse outcome would be? I mean, the fact that you're actually creating um, a consumer product, like at the end, it, it would be potentially a consumer product. Um, from your perspective, wouldn't you maybe make the assumption that there's a possibility that it could go the reverse, where there's now a greater appetite for um, consumption of, you know, an alternative that's a, a rhino horn, where people may refer to wanting to try the the real thing. Uh, I I don't know. I mean. You know, people tell us, oh, your idea won't work, and right. they also increase demand. Yeah. So, I, I don't know, I mean, that's kind of a weird situation to be in, where, like, people won't want your thing, but at the same time, they'll, somehow, they'll want the other thing. Um, you know, we don't think, there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, historical analogies. Like, if you look at, like, um, 
you know, you know Christmas trees, like uh, you know, fake Christmas trees versus real Christmas trees. Right. Um, the, the introduction of fake Christmas trees did not lead to a demand in real Christmas trees. In fact, the demand for real Christmas trees dropped after the introduction of fake Christmas trees. Right. So, so there's definitely historical precedents where basically that doesn't really occur necessarily, where you basically have this um, knock on demand for the real thing per se. I mean, um, you know, we've uh, you know we've we've studied it in, in some detail. Um, you know, we think it's, it's, it's a really strange edge case that probably will not occur. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we, we, we intend to build the best product we can for our clients. So hopefully at the end of the day, there will be no way to distinguish us from wild product, right. um, except maybe the fact that wild product will contain pollutants, whereas we won't contain any pollutants at all because we're built in a quality controlled lab facility. Okay. So, so basically we want to create the best product there that basically is a, a full and, and reliable substitute for what uh, people currently use. And we think that, you know, it's not really, we don't really see how it's going to necessarily inflame demand for the, for the wild product. I mean, right, our right. product is, is a unique offering. Um, and that's actually better than the wild product in lots of ways. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, my next question is, um, what, like, what have been some of the unexpected hurdles that, that, um, you guys have encountered, that payments in, encountered? Uh, unexpected hurdles. It's a good question. Um, uh, well, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's always technical hurdles, uh, you know, around like, you know, um, uh, creating the product itself um, and just basically because we you know we have to build a prototype and then we have to sort of like uh, compare it to uh, you know the data that we've, we've obtained from wild horns and then we need to also always go back and look and see why are we not matching in some aspect or some characteristic and then do some reverse engineering on, on, on you know on the wild horn itself to figure out what, what we're missing or what we need to to include so there's always those things going on um, I guess on the other side uh, uh, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I mean, we always knew that, like, you know, we're challenging the orthodoxy as far as, uh, you know, conservation is concerned. Right, so, going uh, against the status quo, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, I mean, it was not, like, an unexpected hurdle, per se, but, I mean, obviously, we have people who, who think we're a breath of fresh air and that we were at least, you know, shaking up the conversation, conversation and, and trying to figure new avenues for approaching this problem right on the other hand you know people who are just don't want to hear anything about what we're doing and so uh you know that's a hurdle i guess yeah so what have been some of the unexpected um successes to date oh well i guess uh, the press <laughs> i mean we had a lot of press and that was uh, I mean, almost too soon and too early i mean it was great i mean you know we enjoy talking to everybody and 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 you know hearing uh, other people's opinions and, and getting feedback on what we're doing. Right. Uh, but it's, it's been a lot of, uh, for the last, you know, uh, week or two, it's been a lot of, uh, of extra work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so that's unexpected, but it's, po you know, it's a positive. It's, yeah. It's a good problem. So I just have two more questions. I think we're, we're kind of wrapping up. Um, what aspects, um, and this is like from your own personal standpoint, what aspects of um, of Pembian's pursuits keep you up at night? Like, what are you most paranoid about, if anything at all? Ah, uh, good question too. Um, uh, well, I guess you know it's just we want to enter the market in partnership with uh, you know um, companies in, in Asia that maybe have used water buffalo horn or using water buffalo horn or are. Um, uh, you know, use maybe use rhino horn in the past in their in their medicines or their durable goods or their you know uh, their other products. Right. Um, and so basically, you know, finding those partners and basically also as part of partnership agreements, we want to basically help them with the marketing message. Right. Um, so that basically, they you know people understand that this is a, a product that's made in the United States that it's uh, or you know it's a. We're, we're kind of like, uh, I guess, you know, you know Brooks Brothers, right? The, the makers of suits and stuff like that. Right, right. Yeah, so there's a there's like another company called like Laurel Piana, which is a wool textile maker. So a lot of times like Laurel Piana wool will end up in a Brooks Brothers suit. Um, so we want to sort of have like that brand or like Gore-Tex is in like a North Face jacket. Oh, okay. Um, so we want to be sort of like a, a, a branded ingredient to these other products. Right, I right. Think, I think the thing is that we want to basically develop these partnerships that are just more than just like we're an ingredient 
that we're, we're in partnership with them and that we help them with their marketing message and communicate the value of, 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 of lab horn or Pembian horn versus the, the value of wild horn, right. which we think is, is much less. Um, and so I think just, you know, establishing those partnerships and, and, and getting the marketing message and branding right um, with them, you know, obviously uh, keeps me up a little at night, I guess, because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a complex thing. It requires uh, a relationship to form, and it requires you know us uh, to work in partnership with these people um, effectively. And it's you know it, it's always it's always difficult, especially when there's language barriers and there's other things involved, right? So, uh, right, so right. I think that keeps me up at night a little bit. There was one final thing, and this is just from my um, background as I also like freelance as a graphic designer. Um, the company name. How did you guys come up with it? Sure. Um, so there was a there was an article in the New York Times about naming companies. Right. The process to do it. Um, I guess there's consultants that make hundreds of dollars an hour naming companies. Right. So right. I actually followed a very similar process myself. Uh, I just I did learn, learned about it afterwards, but basically I just had a dictionary with just putting out words and then putting out suffixes and prefixes for words. Um, and so Pembe in Swahili is like horn or tusk. Okay. Um, I think there was some elephant named Pembe in a Disney movie at some point. Um, um, and then I E N T is like indication of right. in English as a suffix. So I guess those word, those two words just jumbled together in my mind at some point. So Pembe, I guess, would mean uh, indication of horn or tusk. And I thought it was a pretty cool name. So okay. that's what I went with. Oh, that's cool, man. Oh, cool. And uh, who was the designer? Uh, for, what, for the graphic design? Yeah, for the logo design. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> um, so thanks again, Matt. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully, yeah. you know, when you guys like go to the next level or the next prototype or whatever the next big step is, hopefully I can actually email you again and maybe set up another interview. Definitely, definitely. I, I, I really enjoyed talking to you. Okay, yeah. Um, well, let's see here. Um, I think that basically sums it up. I mean, you know, is there anything else that you want to, you want to add? No, I just uh, thank you for reaching reaching out, and thank you for posting us on your your Facebook uh, sixty uh, sixty words or. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's no problem. That that I mean, what you guys are doing are kind of like the stories I want to get across because there's so many people are concerned about the issues um, that are happening around poetry.